Welcome back. The show is called Brand Equity and I'm Sonali Krishna. Lego. It's been a prominent part for most of our lives as children. It's one of the most formidable names in the kids' genre. And its recent movie was a blockbuster. But one wonders how Lego is surviving the digital takeover, given that kids today are on the tablet surfing YouTube as early as the age of one. Which is why I caught up with Peter Esperson, Lego's head of community co-creation, to find out what the brand is doing to keep engaging its audiences, how it continues to be relevant in such a fast-paced, technology-driven world, and most importantly, what do they do once their fans grow up? Listen in. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. Truly a pleasure having you on Brand Equity. Thank you much, and I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, you know, first things first, uh, Peter, you know, we all, we've all heard about Lego. We've all played with Lego. So, I mean, Lego, really the brand, brings in so much nostalgia because every one of us relates to it. But, you know, look at the new generation of mothers and actually the new generation of children, right? For instance, uh, you know, my nieces or my friend's children, uh, the first thing new mothers do or new, or new, or new uh, parents do is give them the iPad just to engage them as early as a year and a half or two. So in a, in a, in a world which is so digital now that even the one and a half and two year olds are actually uh, so connected and so digital, uh, how is Lego as a company ensuring that they're still relevant uh, to today's children? Yeah, well, Lego's doing a lot in this area. First of all, we have our video games, but we're also working very much on what we call integrating digital and physical play. Okay. We've done things like Lego Fusion, that's currently on the market, where you interact between your iPad, your device, and the physical bricks. I've also done a, uh, or was part of a group that did a very exciting project called Life of George, which was a 2D building experience where you built a little thing in 2D, like a flat Lego piece on a board and then you have to actually scan it to see how fast you can do it. Oh, okay. So you can inter you know, engage kids this way. Though I would say that it's my firm belief that, that physical play is not going to go away. Okay. Just because you have you know, FIFA soccer on your PlayStation, then you still play it in, in real life, right? right? So it's all about hitting the balance. But there's no doubt in my mind that it's increasingly difficult to become relevant in an increasing digital world with a lot of offerings. Tell me, if you just give me a sense of, you know, Lego's traditional business. I'm really talking about the traditional business being, you know, your bricks, yep, yep. right? Um, and, you know, all this new age stuff that you're doing. Um, what is the percent, uh, what, is, what, is the, what does the pie look like in terms of revenue share? Well, I can't comment on that specifically, but I can say that digital is an increasing part of our business and very important for us. Is it more than traditional today? No, it, no, it's not. Uh, okay. but we are still uh, probably a company that are very good at creating, um, you know, toys for kids in a box. But we are getting better and better, and we are investing more mm -hmm. in also the digital space. Uh, you keep having new fans, of course. Yeah, but when your fans grow up, how do you ensure that you keep them engaged in terms of, you know, sheer enthusiasm and creativity? Well, see, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I believe firmly that Lego should be for kids of all ages. And, uh, you know, grown-ups are basically children who have gone insane. So they need to be engaged. The typical pattern you would see would be um, when a kid or a boy or a girl gets up into, you know, their early teens, mid-teens, then they en enter what older Lego fans call the dark ages. That's sure. where they discover the opposite sex sure. and partying, and they don't, then they fall out of building with the Lego bricks. And then some, something happens later in life. They maybe get, they get children, they might discover their old Lego, they might get a Lego set as a gift, and then they come out of the closet or up of the basement, as they say, and then they start building again. And it's a, build, a different building experience here. They build more difficult sets, but a lot of them use it as a medium for creativity, a medium for storytelling. Really? Yes, it's, it's amazing what you can see these people do. They, you know, they can build memes online. That's the very light thing content that they share. But they can, we've seen people build an air-powered Lego car or build an ancient mechanical Greek computer. Peter, you know, um, you're head of co-creation and uh, you're also, uh, you know, involved in engaging with fans and, you know, and getting, uh, you know, the right kind of messaging out. Uh, but I believe a lot of it is actually through crowdsourcing. If I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, 20,000 unsolicited ideas a year? Yes. And see, that, that is a very, it's an interesting question you, you pose here because it, we have something uh, for, for many, many years, even before I joined the company, we call the idea tyranny. And that is the tyranny of everybody has an idea. So the way we selected to solve this is we created a digital platform called Lego Ideas. It basically is a platform where if you have an idea for a Lego product, you can create a prototype, 
then you can make sure to, to market it, tell all your friends, and if 10,000 people think it's a good idea and tell us this through the platform, then we'll review it to a business case, and if the business case makes sense, then we will actually produce it. We have done that. Uh, it started out as a Japanese trial only in 2008. In uh, 2011, we went global with it, and we've launched seven pro uh, products this far, among them LEGO Minecraft, LEGO Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, the great LEGO Birds that's currently flying off the shelves. And, you know, we have a couple of more interesting ones, Big Bang Theory and WALL-E in the pipeline that's coming out later this year or next year. But how do you incentivize these creators? Like, what's in it for them? Yeah, well, first, first of all, the, it's always important that, that you need to be fair. So, of course, if we start selling these things, they, then they get 1% of net sales. Okay. And that, I think that's fair. On that note, thank you so much, Peter. This was truly insightful. Oh, thank you much. It was a pleasure.